When Rose was recovering from childbirth, he wrote her a series of hysterical and filthy little poems just to cheer her up and make her laugh. Oh. And this one is, There once was a young lady named Rose who filled not one palm but twelve pose with piss, sweat, and cum, thick slime from her bum, and snot from her bloody old nose. Oh, isn't that sweet? That I mean, was going to cheer her up? Can't you just picture holding <laughs> little <laughs> Alistair <laughs> Jr. and being like, oh, you minx. Oh. <laughs> Say it again. Everybody. <laughs> History, I'd like to follow me. Welcome to Hilf, history I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody, and it's good to have you in the den. That's the Deluxe Edition Network. To find more great podcasts in the den, click the link in our show notes or go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Now, our Hilf today is Alistair Crowley, and he sucks. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm so glad that I'm doing this episode because after weeks of research, I can finally stop thinking about this prick. Now, historically, he is a big deal. All right, no doubt about that. He is an icon of culture, a disruptor, a poet, an adventurer. I mean, in, in many ways, just my type. But Crowley is a dark figure, a sadomasochistic cult leader, and the inspiration to scores of other cult leaders, from L. Ron Hubbard to Charles Manson. Now, just as intriguing, but so much more likable, <laughs> is my guest, Hyla Johnson. She is a beloved chef, with a cooking show on YouTube, appearances on the Food Channel, Travel Channel, and several published cookbooks. And now... She joins me at my kitchen table. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Pull up a chair and let's get started. I'm glad you don't think I'm a weird pervert. No. Well, you know, there's I'm time. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> I think we've I just mean, begun. <laughs> who isn't a pervert sometimes? <laughs> yeah. I think the only people who are perverts are the people who just start with like, I am not a pervert. Let me start by saying I'm not a pervert. I'm always like, okay. All right. All right. Get out the Vaseline. I don't want to look at your computer. Uh huh. Right. I am not staring at your nipples. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the last time that we like worked together, I was at your house. That's right. And I was on your show, mm-hmm. and it was so much fun. It was like, was it three years ago? Four years ago? I think, it, yeah, it was like right before pandemic. It was so. right before everything hit the yeah. fucking fan. So, yeah, we did um, a beer cheese soup, and you talked about your hero, George Washington. It was awesome. I have links to it. It was People super fun. Are like, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, if you want to get, and the beer cheese soup was fucking delicious. Fucking delicious. Wow. I don't even think I'd ever had that before. Was it your recipe? No, you were like, I want to have you on the cooking show. It'd be fun. And you have great, cool guests always on your, on your show. I do and like I was like, guests. cool. And you said, what you do is you suggest what you want to eat, what you want me to make. And I was like, oh, beer cheese soup, man. That's my people's. <laughs> we, take, we get it intravenously if we're, fa- if we're failing, you know. And you were like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I can do that. And boy, howdy, did you. And then in between, like while you were mixing ingredients, I told the story of George Washington crossing the Delaware. And how you want to boat him. Still do. I know. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. It's okay. It's, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it. It's a long shot. Yeah. I know that. I mean, if Aleister Crowley were still alive, he could probably bring him back from the dead. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything I'm going to ask Aleister Crowley to do for me ever, I'd be like, get out of here, you weird perfect. Actually, hang on one quick second. Do you have the ability to bring back any founding father? Okay, then get the fuck off my yard. (laughs) That's how you get pulled into the darkness, Hyla. I know. I suggested this guy because I, you know, like every normal person, I'm very interested in the occult and occultism and occultists. Yeah. And I'd heard of him and I was like, "Eh, what about that guy? And then I like... Just did some very cursory because I wanted to be mostly surprised. But I, and I was like, oh, my God, this person's horrible. He's what did a- I do? Oh, girl. <laughs> Literally, this mirrors exactly what happened to me. Because so Hyla and I recently reconnected. We hadn't seen each other in forever. We're catching up as we do. And the podcast comes up. And I, will you be my guest? Know that if you talk to me for long enough, I'm going to rope you into being on the show. 
And um, what's your health? She said, Alistair Crowley. And I thought, oh, yeah. I have like two or three things. I kind of know about this guy, I think. Generally just Satanist, kind of famous Satanist, I yeah. think. Kind of a cult leader guy. Yeah, that's a big, dark, interesting, twisted. And then I got this book, girl. <gasps> Look at this fucking thing. I'm, Jesus. She's scared. My friend Hyla just went, whoa, like I'm going to oh beat her to death God. with this thing, which I could. I'm not going to. But I could it's beat you to death It is with a big it. book. And when I choose my sources for my history, I'm not going to say that I look for the short, because I read at least one book for every episode. So I do keep an eye on page length, just because ladies got to keep a schedule, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And every now and again, though, I just drop my head and go, fuck, I got to get the 500 page thorough treatment of like overview. And I got to read the goddamn thing, which I did. And if I sound pissed off, I am. Because this guy fucking sucks. Now, is he intriguing? Yeah. Was it a page turner? Fuck yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the problem. See, that's what you said. It's like, we hate these guys. We hate these occultists. I don't really oh, want to like, fuck him. But this is where we get the history channel, channel turns into the Hitler channel. This is where really nice, decent, scared Christian people spend all day watching murder, murder documentaries and listening to murder, murder podcasts because I uh, can't help it. Well, and that's why every single news headline is terrible, terrible, murder, murder. Yeah. Everyone thinks going to hell. Totally. And we're all, it's the, it's the media Rocked. version of this tastes bad. Try it. Do you know, where we just can't, we don't know why. We're like, this is repulsive. Gimme. Yeah, I want everyone I know to try it. Exactly. And it's not right. It is certainly human, and it's been going on forever. And so... Is this the know. nastiest bastard you've ever helped? Thank you for asking. Uh, yeah. It's the... Well, wow. I don't know if I would say, yeah, he's the nastiest bastard I've ever helped. And I will say this. He's the first hilf I don't like. Wow. I have found... This is how I got through college. <laughs> This is going to give you a certain insight into me. <laughs> you may have noticed Dawn is passionate. Dawn mm -hmm. loves, loves deeply. I give a shit. I, mm, and I make noises when I love stuff. And if I'm not captivated by something, it's very quickly for me to just kind of move on. Mm -hmm. Right? So sometimes if something's really important, I will kind of force myself to try to love it. You have to trick yourself. Let's trick myself into being like, yeah. And one of the things I did, this is not healthy. I do not recommend this, is I would try to develop a crush on all of my professors. Regardless of age, gender, I would try to find something about the professor that I was like, oh, so that I would go to class and then mm -hmm. give a fuck about mm -hmm. how they felt about how I was doing. Because mm -hmm. I was already like, yeah, yeah. I don't think this is worth my time. Right. But I'll do it because... You wore those jeans yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's, again, this is great. This is what we do. And something like that happens with Hilf. You know, I get like, ooh, I'm going to jump. I'm going to research. And I'm going to, I'm not going to be unbiased. I'm going to be biased towards love it. Because my guest assigned it for a reason. They probably love it. Or if they don't love it, I'm going to try to convert them into like, girl, once you know more, then you'll love it. Aleister Crowley, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I started with like, give it to me, Aleister Crowley, you dirty little Satanist, you bald little disruptor you weird and then every page i was like you are a shallow selfish inconsistent you know abandoning people that you're just a like, slimy little fuck who dessert doesn't deserve it so hmm. do you want to pick someone else uh -oh. <laughs> Like, I read, I read, I read this these God, Are you kidding book? me? Fuck no. We're fucking um, this guy. You can. This is the first time. We're going to hold Aleister Crowley down. Let me tell you what you're, we're going to do. All right. We're going to fuck Aleister Crowley. Okay. So hard. Mm -hmm. And with such unrelenting, unforgiving... Fury? Fury. Okay. That maybe we will render him here with us. That would be so Should unnerving. Get a Ouija board out? I don't out? know what's about to happen. This is like, we're a little sober for this. I'm gonna you be know what? Honest. I had a very, I'm not going to go into it, but I just saying I had a very fucked up dream last night <sighs> that in that when I woke up, I felt like someone, like a spirit was sitting on my chest. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. Oh, don't. We're going to fall. What if we fall in? Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> what if we get to the end of this and we're carving his name into our tits and stuff? Fuck. Oh, my God. You know what? Hide the razor blades. Buckle up, everybody. I will tell you this. I started with he's a prick. He's an unlikable prick, and he is. People who knew him in his tangible mortal life 
Agreed. Couldn't agree more. And we're also intrigued by him. You know what I mean? It wasn't like these figures where he was deluding people, generally thought he was very loved. And then after his death, it was like, oh my God, he was like the total what master. Doing? Yeah. He was very open <laughs> about wasn't his like, fuckery. He was called like the most throughout. evil man in the world. The like, wi- yep. The wickedest man in the yeah. world. The beast 666. I mean, yeah. So as I go through what a cunt he is, know that I am also going to give occasionally a very objective eye for why he is also beloved. I can do that. Okay. Okay. Um, before we move on, though, to our buddy Alistair, I want to fuck um, you for just a hot minute because just I um, I didn't read a 500-page book, girl, but I did go to your website. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some questions. You've written four cookbooks, or am I missing some? Because I've seen that you are credited for other cooking publications, but I'm not sure if they, they are books. Uh, yeah. So um, Chris and I published ourselves uh one two three four cookbooks and then after that i got um a publisher reached out to me to ask if i wanted to write a cookbook about texas cooking since i'm from texas and Mm -hmm. uh and i did and it was actually like the fucking easiest job in the world because they were like you can use recipes that you already have on your website and all we need is like new head notes and just make it cute. Write an intro. There's some copy so, and paste. Yeah. Check, basically. Yeah. Good for yeah. you. Yeah, it was And nice. that one is called, let's see, We Have Learned to Cook. Was that the first one? Yeah, that's the one I wrote, like, in the evenings after I got home from my day job when oh. Chris and I first started the cooking show. Oh, I love this. And then... Were you wearing we, a little apron? Uh, I was probably wearing scrubs because I was Cute. working at a dental office. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I... Uh, yeah, and then Chris, so we put it up for sale, and we sold it as a PDF first because it was expensive to self-publish an actual print-on-demand book, and also that was that would have been like the 2010s, and mm-hmm. PDF books were like new and mm-hmm. a thing. And we were like, okay, we need to make enough money to buy ourselves a new computer so we can edit faster, and we made exactly twenty five hundred dollars, which we spent. On a new computer, and then we're like, we should have, we should have dreamed we, a little bigger. If we would have made twenty six hundred dollars. <laughs> we could have gone out for a nice dinner. Well, <laughs> some of the next time, we baby, should. next time. Add, add yeah. a couple more zeros on that. But anyway, um, so yeah, so that was kind of, but it just it was very validating that like, yeah. you know, you can sometimes just put an idea out into the universe and then it comes true. Amazing and multiplies because then you yeah. did the breakfast taco book. Mm-hmm. Little Which, local Texas cookbook. So, that's yeah, that's one. the the published one. It has some cute little, like, watercolor illustrations, which I did not do, but they're very oh, sweet. Cute. And then what's Cave Lady cooking? That was when, like, paleo was really big. Yeah. Look at you trending, girl. I Get know. it. Get your money. Um, so, yeah, I don't even know if that one, if you can, like, find that one anymore. So if okay. you have a copy of it, it's probably worth at least $5 to someone. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Among the things I love about you is that you just, you're very accomplished and you do it all. You feel very fearless. You feel, you have this very calming energy about you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And that one of my favorite things is, like, I've sat down next to you in a various environments, often sometimes chaos. People, There's chaos around us. We're busy restaurant. Everyone's trying to order. People are bumping around. And I'm always sort of like feel this just like, mm, I'll be like, hi, Hila. Mm. It's like, oh, Don, how are you? And it's just sort of like, oh, it was terrible getting here. You know, I'm, I was just about losing my mind. And it's like, that's such cool still waters, man. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. That's like the best compliment I've had today. All right. At least. I did mention how great your nipples are, too. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk, I mean, I'll keep track of all my compliments for you if you leave track of like, write a too, list. <laughs> They'll keep a list for you. You can take it home and refer to it. Uh, well, let's bring your flawless nipples and all of my research mm-hmm. and commence the fucking of this bastard, okay. Alistair Crowley. Do you feel thoroughly lubricated? My, my titties are ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm delighted. Um, I, I like to start with a story and often I select whatever story I want to tell first because it it really gives us like an introduction um into their origin but in this case the best (laughs) origin story for our guy Alistair is starting sort of midway through his life so know that I'm going to go back and I'm going to bring you up to speed on how he got into the dark arts and how he gets in the story but 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 come with me first into the throes of Alistair Crowley's honeymoon with his wife Rose (gasps) 
He is about 28. He's already known as a sort of a dark figure. He is a member of some secret societies that are very involved in dark magic and some Satan worship and some drugs, but it's secret. So <laughs> obviously not a, pop- a lot of people know about it. And it's 1904. So we're talking pre-World Wars, kind of thrust of the early and parts of the Industrial Revolution. He's English and he and his wife are going through, they've gone through Paris, they've been to London, they've been through Cairo. And one of the things that they're doing as they go through this particular part of their honeymoon is he is wearing silks and a turban, and he is going by some exotic-seeming Indian name, Mm. as is his wife Rose, and she's being carried aloft on this sort of carriage by all of these servants who run ahead of them and clear the road. It pictures sort of a Aladdin when he enters, uh-huh. you know what I mean? Really trying. Really, really flair try. for drama. Yeah. Yeah. And they're just basically pretending to be royals from some exotic made up place. That sounds fun. Yeah. And Buck, this is kind of buckle up. Like this is norm. This is, this is par for the course <laughs> for these fucking weirdos. Who knows why they're doing it? Um, and while they're, they're going through this place and, and going to all of these exotic sort of spiritual places, places that Alistair feels are powerful in the spiritual realm, his wife Rose claims at one point to be hearing the voice of the god Horus. And he's speaking to her about Alistair Crowley. Mm-hmm. Among the wild things that happen after this is that Alistair goes, please. <laughs> so what you hear about the crazy shit this fucking guy believes and does. The idea that he would look at anyone ever and be like, please, is ridiculous. But he's kind of like, listen, babe, you're not qualified to hear the voice of, mm-hmm. of any god. Okay, that's kind of my role. And she's like, yeah, well, babe, I'm hearing it. And it's Horace. And he's saying, you need to buckle up because they're coming. They are exactly asterisks. Come on, who's they? And Alistair Crowley's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just like, you don't actually. What? Okay, fine. You think you're hearing from this god horse? What's he look like? What's his favorite color? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because only him and his obscure fucking friends know about some of these weird ancient gods. Still, and you Horus know? was an Egyptian god, right? Yeah, yeah. A hor- a, yeah, sort of absorbed and reimagined, but yes, ultimately an ancient. Yeah, and um, and she's nailing his Q and A, girl. Oh, and she's like, well, he looks like this. Well, he said that. Well, he this or that. And she's getting all of his answers correct. But he's still skeptical because he's a fucking misogynist. Well, there you go. And yeah. he um, takes her ultimately to this local museum. And he's like, why don't you go ahead and find Horace then? If he's the one who's talking to you, find him. And from across the room, long before she can like see the name on the exhibit or the exhibit number, she's like, that's him. There he is. And they go across the museum and they see this huge sculpture. And fucking hey, not only is it Horus, but the exhibit number is six, six, six. <gasps> mm-hmm. And our boy, Alistair Crowley, is what we call convinced. Okay. And he's like, oh shit, yeah, we've unlocked some powerful magic up here in Cairo. So. Um, and he starts getting information from her. Then, good news, he starts hearing from Horace directly. She says, what he wants oh. you to do is go sit one hour a day. You turn your back, you get your pen, and you're just going to be writing down everything he says. And Horace, what do you know, shows up just at the right time, speaks directly to Aleister Crowley, speaks to Aleister Crowley in three different voices from three different gods, gives him all sorts of instructions on how to live. And from this, Aleister Crowley writes the Book of the Law. It is this book that he writes during this period of time that is not all of the sacred documents that, mm-hmm. that form the part of his future religion, future cult that he forms, but it's sort of the backbone of it. Um, the religion that he ultimately introduces is called the Thelema, and these things, these things that he received in this moment are the substance of the text. This reminded me of, like, what's his name joseph smith when like right. i looked in yeah. my hat yeah and there it was yes exactly and god told me to write it down yes and now we have a new thing and the book of the law and thelema is a religion that l ron hubbard briefly ascribes to about 10 years prior to his founding of scientology mm. the primary thrust of the book of the law is do what thou wilt that is the whole of the law. That's how it starts. Do whatever the fuck you want. 
that would be one way you don't have to care about anything correct or anyone do what thou wilt now there are if you're a steadfast thelemalite thelemalite i don't know what they're called um if you are a devotee to thelema Mm -hmm. then you you would say oh of course not there are there are exceptions you know you have to take into account the god knew it does emphasize the power of love and love is defined as yeah but um do what thou wilt that is the whole of the law seems fairly straightforward to me yeah um it is at this point I want to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Although he is hardly the first egomaniacal cultist, mm-hmm. okay, Aleister Crowley is considered kind of the great granddaddy of our modern cults and what we recognize, especially if you be watching the murder, murder documentaries, which I sure do. Mm-hmm. I, I judge because I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you've watched a lot of these cult documentaries, you know there are some situations, some events, some circumstances from childhood that many of these dark figures share. Mm-hmm. So the question is, which of these classic cult leader formative childhood situations did Aleister Crowley not experience? Okay. A, an upbringing in a strict religious conservative household. Okay. B, had an early fascination with torturing and killing animals. C, a loss of a father figure at an early age. Or D, lived in poverty and was ostracized for it. Okay. So which ones? Okay. I I know he he was not poor. Well, I'm pretty sure that he was actually grew up pretty wealthy. So that one's gone. And the the question is, which one of these was he was not? Oh, that one. That's the one. You're exactly right. And not only was he not poor girl. Yeah, he was very, very wealthy. Now, this conservative sort of strict upbringing with wealth, I think, is also part of it because he his the, the, the Christian sect that his parents were such devotees of was called the Brethren. Hmm. His that sounds dad, culty too. Totally culty. Very culty. And his dad was a was a head preacher within the brethren, and they were no fun, no music, no sex, shame, hide. But listen ultimately to me, but also not Catholic, like designedly, mm-hmm. like we are making our own rules in here and we can change the rules that we inherited. How did his parents get their money? Um, his father's family had, I believe, a printing business and his mother family, mother's side of the family had some like agricultural wealth. So it came from both sides, but they were, and his mother converted to the brethren after she married his dad. So, and she was just as kind of you devout, know, devout as he was. Um, but he also, uh, loses his virginity to a prostitute. Well, this is so after Aleister Crowley's dad dies when he's 11. That's another kind of ticket okay. off the mm-hmm. list. His dad dies of tongue cancer when he's 11. <gasps> As a preacher, this, of course, had significant meaning to him. The uh-huh. idea of cut your tongue out for speaking lies kind of deal. Uh-huh. And when his dad dies, he's 11 years old, and his mom sends him to go live with the uncle who's like, well, things have been a little too strict for you, buddy. I'm going to loosen up the ropes a little. And he gets him a prostitute so that he can lose his virginity. At age 11? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, within a year or two. Yeah. Jesus. Arguably an overcorrection. Uh Mm Uh-huh. But it sure wakes up our friend at the time named Edward. Crowley. He is not yet referred to as Alistair. He changes Mm. his name. And he is like, this is much better. (laughs) 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 Having sex with prostitutes is great. (laughs) And so much better than not having sex with anything. Um, He tortures and kills a cat. He hears that they have nine lives. So he t- finds a cat oh. and he kills it variously nine different ways. So he's until a little he scientist. Knows, oh, apps. Isn't he just such a promising <laughs> young man? He rapes a maid on oh. his mother's bed. Oh. Yeah. What I'm saying is uh, he lashes out mm-hmm. and does practically every evil thing that he can conceive of to its fullest in a somewhat untethered way from the instant his dad died, like, he's sort of fired like a bottle rock. All under the age of like 13. Correct. Jesus. At least within a few years of, yeah, with a few years of his dad's death. Um, the name, he, he's called the wickedest man in the world, but his most consistent nickname was The Beast 666. That name was given to him by his mother. <gasps> his mother 
who is this super duper religious part of the brethren? This is not a cute, like my little beast. Yeah. My little six, six, you no. naughty and you mischief. She was like, he is Satan. Is Satan. She's kind of, a, this is hard to explain. She's kind of an interesting, lighthearted woman <laughs> in the sense that as he goes deeper off the deep end, she makes fun of him in some amusing ways that we'll get to. But mm. in this sense, I felt no humor in the nickname. And she seemed certainly to see him as a dark and dangerous figure. I, I wonder if she felt guilty, like, or like if she had sinned in some way, like why would she be the one to like birth this demon child? Yeah. It doesn't say great things about you to be like, I gave birth to the antichrist. I didn't do it. No, I gave birth to it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, but the bottom line is there are a lot of rich damaged young men in Britain who oh. like torturing cats and having sex with the maid. And, sure. I mean, like this is awful, but it's also not that unusual. So what turns it's still not that unusual still not that unusual yeah. all around the world what i'm saying is if you're a cat near a private school get the fuck <laughs> 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 um so the question i had as i was reading so what happens now okay because this is not the most original or origin story we've ever heard it's not even the most original bad guys origin story we've ever heard so what turns him from kind of a nasty little fuck into the beast the beast 666 yeah. well <laughs> you'll be delighted to know that it starts in a bar mm, my mm. favorite place mm -hmm. i think some of the best things start in a bar <laughs> um to bring us there we now catch up with alistair carley's in his early 20s he went to cambridge and really at this point he's just kind of a nasty vet he's just kind of a nasty asshole you know mm -hmm. what i mean he he's getting in trouble his first lover was a female impersonator a guy who went by the name of jerome pollitt wow and um, he climbs mountains in the Alps. Uh, he's changed his name to Alistair because it's cool and he likes the way it sounds. Alistair Crowley feels like a powerful name to him. And he is not just mountain climbing. He's like the real deal, like up into the Alps, breaking records, making friends with like really impressive mountain climbers around the world. He um, joins the chess club. And is like impossibly good at chess and beats the president of the chess club like the first year. And he's writing funny, sexy, kinky, really good poetry. Oh. I'm telling you at this point, I'm like, all right. I'd fuck that dude. I'd fuck Alistair Crowley. And at this point in the book, I'm like, fun. Right. Yeah. I'm, well, he's a blowhard. And I don't know about you. I went to theater school. I'm in a lot of comedy clubs. It's not hard to spot a blowhard, right? Mm -hmm. And he, even though he has accomplished a few of these things, he's still in his early 20s or whatever. And he goes to a bar and he's acting like, I know everything. I know everything about alchemy. I know everything about all these mysterious things that not a lot of other people do. And as often happens, an older fella who is an expert in what this young idiot is talking about steps in and is like, I am, in fact, an uh, analytical chemist, a master in alchemy. And they start drinking and talking a little bit. And if Alistair has any benefits, it is that he does recognize his betters. And when he has something to take from you, something to learn from you, he will take it mm -hmm. and learn it, right? And this guy's name is Julian Baker. And over the course of their conversation in this bar, he generally alludes to knowledge of a secret society that knows even more about alchemy and science and dark magic and things that are sort of hidden from normal people. And Alistair had like kind of read about this in a couple of his books. There's like reference. It's almost like when, when astronomers look out into the universe and are like, we don't know what a black hole is. We just see where there's nothing, where there should be something. And we're trying to guess what's in there. He was like reading it and they just kept being like, there's this organization. And then there'd be this hole of like, who are they? Where are they? What do they do? Where mm -hmm. do they come from? He wakes up the next morning and this guy, Julian Baker, is gone. He went on this awesome hike and I was just like, no, the guy who might have the link to the thing that can get me involved. And he goes 10 miles on foot to chase this guy down to try to be like, you're the guy, tell me, I, we left our conversation. And the guy is like, you know, hi, wow, you ran all this way. That's amazing. Um, okay, uh, his name is George Cecil Jones. I'll introduce you to him, and he will make the introduction. So holy shit. Alistair Crowley so gets close. connected to this guy, right? He gets connection to George Cecil Jones, who, after spending a little time with Alistair, gets the savvy, this kid's, yeah, got the gift. And he makes an introduction to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've heard of this. This rings yeah. bells. Okay. So as then, as now, 
There's all kinds of cults, all sorts of flavors. Are you a religious cult? Are you a fraternal cult? Are you a hermetic cult? I don't know what that word means. Oh, good, because here's your question. (laughs) (laughs) What is a hermetic cult and where does it get its name? It's multiple choice. Okay. Is it A, hermetic, as in hermetically sealed, meaning the cult is tightly closed off and members are not allowed to come and go? Is it B, hermetic, as in the man, Hermes Trismegistus, an ancient figure who was attributed to early magic and especially alchemy? Or is it C, hermetic, as in hermits, meaning they live far away from any kind of organized civilization? Okay, first of all, I want to say I've never recognized the association between the word hermit as a person and hermetically sealed, but that's beautiful. (laughs) And I'm going to go with B. You are absolutely correct. You oh. got two of the two. Hermetic is after the dude, Hermes, who is this classic figure. And he was a scientist and he was in alchemy and very serious. And if you're drawing a line, you can draw a line from like him to the Freemasons, Merlin, crusaders right okay. if one Sword is in, in a the stone se- yeah exactly if one is in a secret society at this particular time end of the 1800s turn of the century into the 20th century um there was a lot of especially in europe this idea of like we have an ancient history that is european mm-hmm. you know that we can draw harness the power oh, yes, and, very yeah. important. so for alistair at this point in his life to have exposure and actually an introduction to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Not only have they found it, he's fucking in it. in it. This is, the Golden Dawn is easily for Alistair, especially from me looking, you know, anyone looking at it this from hindsight is like, this is consciously and subconsciously absolutely everything he has ever wanted. It is, I mean, he was raised in a cult by his daddy, and this is a cult run by some daddies. Yes. Check. Love them. The other members of the cult are big time famous writers, W.B. Yeats, Bram Stoker. So it's like good for really? him. Like, yes. Like secret societies <gasps> always have a very tangible so moral. It's like the Scientologist here mm-hmm. in Hollywood. Oh, isn't that interesting? Or Holly Weird, I should say. <laughs> you. Um, exactly. So there's like, it's also a professional benefit and he gets to be counted among his betters, uh, yeah, which yeah. makes him very happy. And this place seriously claims to have the answers to life death and the meaning to everything which what human would not go ahead and like to know the answers to life death and the meaning of it at all but especially when you've lost your dad young and you're in your 20s and you know i feel like the 20s yeah very like, important now yes. i now i could care less yeah no it's like fine. it doesn't exist get over it have some more tea <laughs> <laughs> let's but go to a bar he's not there yet exactly <laughs> so he gets into the golden dawn because he's their favorite things he's uh spooky and he's rich Mm. and um and he's smart and he's you know he's really good at chess he's very brave he's he's got all of these attributes we've already talked about but in the golden dawn and moving up mm, within the hierarchy of the golden dawn is two separate things because um spoiler alert all cults have a hierarchy you either have to buy your way in or prove your loyalty you know what i mean murder your way in murder your way in (laughs) what i'm saying is there's always this test of loyalty this test of fine give us money read our books buy our thing and that's how you become more holy more special, Mm -hmm. and you move up our pyramid-esque scheme of faith. The Golden Dawn was no different, but they were also new. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was only 11 years old. (laughs) But how many people were in it? Well, Well, it started very small. Um, There were only like a few, and it was like three guys, and then they start because it's a, you know, it's like getting podcast listeners, you know, <laughs> where it spreads, you get special guests, you get invited into their cult. Wait, wait, am I in a cult now? <laughs> we'll see. I'll, I'm not going to tell you until the end. Uh, but, um, you know, it's growing. And one of the things, so it's young, but the ancient uh, texts that they have uh, predate them. So the, the Order of the Golden Dawn was essentially founded by three guys. And because it's really young, they have all of these growing pains and one of the first ones that starts is these three guys um are uh, know each other already from freemason general kind of secret culty stuff that's similar but claims to hold that thread from merlin and hermes 
the idea is that we have the actual documents, that there are sacred scrolls, there are books of spells, mm. there are codes and languages and secrets that have been, fuck it, name it, saved from the library of Alexandria, were discovered in a cave that one of the knights uh, from the Crusades carried with him that holds the one and only secret recipe to get the secret knowledge that kind of thing, sure. right? So even though their organization is only 11 years old, they have some of these. And they actually works. do. Yes. Whether it have right, copies of copies them, at of least. Them, and okay. some of the originals, because these are all old, rich families that can trace their lines. Their great granddaddy yeah. was a Freemason. Great, yeah. great, great granddaddy. You know, this is who they are. Specifically, the one of these leaders, his name is Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. You'll be hearing me call him just Mathers from here on out because it's pretty much all the way that everybody referred to him, including Alistair. And he is from a Scottish Freemason family. <laughs> I'm going to laugh because at its root, all religions are silly. You know, from John Smith looking into his hat, this is my perspective. <laughs> but this is like when you really get down to like how it started, it's hard not to giggle. So... Mathers starts the Order of the Golden Dawn by perusing some of these documents that he and his other sort of tightly knit friends have gotten together. He's interpreted codes, he's, he's read languages that are old and lost, and he thinks he's figured out a name and an address. Oh. <gasps> exactly. And the name and the address lead him to this woman named Anna Sprengel. A lady? A lady. There's women in the Golden Dawn. Oh, wow. That Isn't seems that very progressive. Very progressive. And he reaches out to Anna Sprengel, and he's like, girl... Is it you? And she goes, it me, baby. Hmm. I am the one. I am your oracle. You did it. You cracked the code. What, get a pen. I'm going to dish some serious knowledge on you, including how you're going to run your wit rituals, who can get into the Golden Dawn, what they got to do, oh and how God. they whatever. And so Mathers, all these holy documents from this holy woman who he alone knew because he found the scrolls, and he now has access to... <gasps> The secret chiefs, yes, the secret chiefs, other than human, other than worldly what? entities with whom he can speak. Who aliens? will give him, yeah, sure, other than worldly, you don't know. Are they gods? Are they angels? Are they demons? Are they aliens? Are they the collective subconscious of people that you, with whom you are astro? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But they are the real deal. They speak the real truth. And they're going to lay out precisely how you and y'all's buddies are going to do your society. And it's based on this that over the last 11 years, they've got, give or take, 150 people. Members. Okay. Okay. So Alistair then comes in, and he's trying to get up into that second order, right? That's the every the plebes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't so hard. Now he wants to get in that second. Because once you get in the second order, you get more scrolls. Yas. Okay. You get access to more rituals. Hot. Mm-hmm. This is all he's ever wanted. And um, Mathers is like... I approve you. I think you could go into second order, but then all the other members of the second order go, no. They refuse to move him up. Oh, I bet he's pissed. Yeah. And one of the reasons why they refuse to move him up is because he's gay. Well, he's bisexual anyway. He has had male lovers that maybe he's just not as ashamed about. Mm -hmm. He has been too public about. And we can worship Satan, and we can wear silly mm -hmm. outfits and kill goats. But, but you're going to be a homo? No. We're mm -hmm. really not cool with that. And he demonstrates a great deal of shame for his homosexual uh, life, which is pr considering the sexual uh, violence and the sexual perversion, uh, uh, like including the least of my worries. that he yeah. has, doesn't flinch about. He is oddly in the closet throughout his life about just being like, I'm not gay. Was that, though, just because he wanted to get into the second order? Is that like when he started masking it? Yes. I mean, he was always sort of like... Well, Cambridge won't like, like, I don't want to get kicked out, kicked out of school. And if you're a big time Hilf listener uh -huh, and you have consumed my Oscar Wilde episode, Oscar Wilde went to jail for being gay. Alistair Crowley's freshman year of college. Oh, that's a big story. Correct. So there are some parallels between Oscar Wilde and Alistair Crowley. They didn't know each other, but I would honestly, if you were going to put those two together, I would say similar, similar. Alistair Crowley is a dark figure. And Oscar Wilde is a joyful, humorous character. But they were both, they grew up in the same time, similar mm -hmm. backgrounds, similar punishments, sim similar proclivities. Um, but in that sense, he was like, I don't want to go that way, even if it was noble, <laughs> right? Like, no, no way. So in the same period of time that Alistair Crowley's trying to figure out, oh, how do I get up to that second order? How do I get 
myself into the good graces of these folks, there is a bit of division among the second order of Mathers. They're already starting to question him. And Mathers goes, guess what? Anna Sprangle isn't dead. Because after he heard from her and got all of her sacred uh -huh. writings, he was like, guys, I, got, I found Anna Sprangle because I found her name and she gave me all this stuff. And then she died. But it's okay because I've got them all. Now he comes back and he's like, she's not dead. She actually came to my house last night. Uh -huh. And she was like, I have a bunch more wisdom to give you. And he was right there. What? She did. And Wait, she's she like, really? Yeah. And she was like, I'm Anna Sprangle, girl. I ain't dead. And I have more wisdom to give you. And all I need from you is for you to give me some of the Golden Dawn's sacred documents as well. I'll just mm -hmm. check your work. Also, Trading. some money would be great. And have you met my hot 30 years younger than me husband? And they stay with him for a while. And then, uh-oh. Mathers is like, they're con artists. Fuck. Uh-huh. They're not. That's real. not really it. Which I find this story very fascinating because I thought up to this <clears throat> point, Mathers is a con man. He makes up this Anna Sprengel so that he can say, I had access to this woman who gave me all the documents and then she died. That's sort of like my boyfriend in Canada. Yeah. That's yeah. very nice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but now hearing this story that he got con, but didn't even know it was a con was like, he must've been like, when girls showed up, he must've been like, fuck, really? But he, I mean, so did he lie the first time and he didn't act? Cause you would know that it's not the same person, right? And also these guys, a lot of times, one of the things I found is I right when you're trying to time. get, right when you're trying to figure out if they're lying or con men, one of the things I found is it fills in all the blanks when you get really confused. Is it the real, the reality of true believers, mm -hmm. right? And so when you have a true believer in stuff that is as squishy as astro projection, automatic writing, mm -hmm. who is moving my hand? It's not me. It's this invisible figure. Mm -hmm. It is entirely possible that you were like, I, I wrote to this woman named Anna Sprengel and then I had a dream and I woke up and I wrote it and that was her telling me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what but I mean? You really believe it. And you, you're still saying, yeah, I read Anna Sprengel gave me the, I wrote. And she told me, but in reality, you've never met a physical woman. In reality, she never sent you any papers. And that wouldn't even discount you to the people you told it to. Right. Because they're like, like yeah. that makes it more magical. Yeah. Amazing. So that she showed up in the flesh to help you out in a moment that you needed her. <laughs> Great. Yeah. But then he was like, oh, oh, shit. oh fuck. Oh, I'm, I'm just letting fucked. these weirdos fucking stay in my house. I gave him all this money. Ah, fuck. And he gave him a bunch of gold <laughs> dots. Ah, eat shit. <laughs> what this means is there's trouble. The, do the Golden Dawn's got some problems mm -hmm. and the second order that had already been like we're not sure that you're the best leader and we're not we don't actually love everybody that you're trying to move up into the second order mm -hmm. are also like and maybe you're not even supposed to be our leader come back alistair crowley is like let me help hi mathers you seem in a weakened state and i can be here to help and have i mentioned how fucking rich I am. And even though, <laughs> and even though the Golden Dawn, technically, you don't, we don't buy and sell things to one another. Let's be honest. I mean, it's yeah. never bad to have a rich, rich friend yeah. who needs something from you. Right? Yeah. So Mathers and Aleister Crowley get together and it's like, okay, yes, you're right. I am the leader of the Golden Dawn. You are, a, you know, an appropriate member of the second order. And so Mathers apart from the rest of the cult, just like poof, ordains Aleister Crowley as a full-fledged member of the Second Order without all of the artifacts, without all of the, the timelines, voting and having then, not yeah. gone through, yes, the, the procedures that he created and invented and that everybody else had gone through. Then he sends Aleister Crowley to the Golden Dawn HQ <laughs> over there in London where they have their vault that contains all of their sacred all texts. The scrolls. And Alistair and his girlfriend, Elaine Simpson, break into the vault, change the locks, <gasps> take some of the documents, write Alistair Crowley's name in the holy scroll that says, I'm in the second order now, and then send a message. <laughs> I know, right? Then they send a message <laughs> out to these members of the second order saying, hi. I am now a member of Second Order, and you all are in trouble with yeah. Mathers. Uh -huh. You need to show up tomorrow, tomorrow at the headquarters, where I, Alistair Crowley, am going to interview each of you. 
And at the end of that interview, you will be giving a pledge of loyalty oh to Mathers. God, it's a fucking coup. Right? But don't panic, guys. I'm going to be wearing the mask of a racist, so you know that I'm being impartial. I'm just here to answer questions. <laughs> I'm not here to cause any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> just a honest questions. And uh, so he goes away, comes back the next day. With his cape and his mask and his book and all of his pencils are sharpened. Okay. And the members of the Second Order are there. Yates is there. Mm. And the landlord of the building. Where you just went in and changed the locks high. Yeah. But he Who, wasn't a member of the... Who's cult. also a member oh. of the Golden Dawn. Well, that's Who's why they also yeah. the head of the Trade Association... Which is essentially looking at this like you can't break in and steal their trade secrets. Like this is an organization with secret mm -hmm. documents and you went in and broke like that's a very tangible law, like a legal easy thing that has nothing to do with secret Theft societies. And, you stole, yeah. Yeah. and you stole proprietary documents. Also as the member of the cult, landlord of this building who is talking about trade association stuff, you, Alistair Crowley, are also in debt because you used to run a bunch of, you're kind of a con man anyway, you owe us money. Oh. And then the other person who's there is the constable. Like the cop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Alistair is like, um, <laughs> hey guys, you know what? Uh, all right. I see. It. Yep. Fair. Fair. Okay. Okay. And he <laughs> says, I'm going to go get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I was like, I mean, this is, this book is a laugh a minute. And he goes away and he gets a lawyer because, you know, it's not, I am all powerful and I talk to God, but sometimes you need some litigious, you know, assistance. Sure. Yeah. He goes and gets a lawyer. And he sues the Golden Dawn for because of something they took from him. He says, you took something from me. And they were like, buddy. And they counter sue, of course. Mm -hmm. You took all of our shit. And you're in trouble. And he's like, okay, fine. And he ultimately leaves London with a voluntary dismissal and paying a huge fine. And is no longer in the Golden Dawn. Well, that's up to Mathers, right? Which is his buddy. Mm, which is his buddy. But what you can see, of course, is this huge crack. Oh, within yeah. it that is going to be very difficult to resolve i bring us to this point this is one of the reasons why i laid out these stories in this particular order it's because what i'm hoping is you can see alistair crowley as courageous a risk taker certainly full of his own self-confidence mm -hmm. and has no loyalty right. he this is these are these are examples between how he treated his wife and how he got the whole thing that is a great man who does nothing but take yeah take take break it break it to the ground I, he wanted to be a part of this golden dawn but he will break it apart if violate its laws it. yeah. to become its lawmaker this yeah. is a fundamental part of who he is and when we come back from the break we're going to talk about the lunatics and sex magic that comes next yes <laughs> this podcast is part of the deluxe edition network to find other great shows on the network head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Hey, listeners, since you're a fan of this podcast, you clearly enjoy learning fascinating history facts, which is why we think you'll love our show. It's called Midnight Facts for Insomniacs and features weekly deep dives into a variety of topics. It also features us, comedians and lifelong friends Shane Rogers and Duncan McEwen. So whether you're nocturnal, sleep-deprived, or just a fan of laughing and learning, we'll keep you entertained with more than 130 episodes covering everything from astrology to pirates to the history of personality tests. Just search for Midnight Facts in any podcast player to join the Midnight Masses. All right, yes, Alistair Crowley is a selfish prick, but do you know who is the opposite? Like a generous figure who loves love, who gives love, and who really knows how to keep the history coming? My patrons. <laughs> and so many of you have jumped in the sack with us, and I deeply thank you. The latest to join us are Patience E and Rick B. Mm. Mm, their intelligence, sex appeal, and generosity shall have them eternally remembered in our sacred annals. <laughs> if you'd like to join them, have access to bonus material, and hear your name here next time, <laughs> go to patreon.com slash hilfpodcast and... Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. I 
I feel like I feel like Alistair is nude. Like we've got him naked. Mm -hmm. He's restrained, mm -hmm. but he's still into it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I think everyone's still having a good time, but I want to. I want him to be uncomfortable at some point. I think ideally we're going to start holding up some mirrors to our guy that will make this experience slightly less pleasurable for him. Mm -hmm. That's a little, my a little uncomfortable. Indeed. Um, but as we return to this unlikable fucking piece of shit, piece of shit I, I, before I start really sh giving you his worst, I do want to start with what I like about Alistair Crowley because I am nothing if not fair and balanced. It's sort of like when you do left nipple, it's like, it's great. It feels great. But let, let's give righty mm -hmm. just a second, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I do like a lot of his poetry and his paintings are very interesting. I think when Aleister Crowley is at his best, it is as just an artist. Mm -hmm. An artist can do whatever they want. An artist can be a real asshole. Yeah. And I will still respect you. You should have just stuck and respect with that. Your art. Yeah. yeah. Is when you start being like, I'm God and I tell you what to do. But I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here are some uh, excerpts <laughs> from some of my favorite poems. Okay, good. I was hoping we'd have time. Mm, okay. Um, this one I like because it's funny and self-deprecating and God knows he should deprecate because mm -hmm. he sucks. A little more. Uh, Bury me in a quick lime grave. Three parts a fool and one part knave. A superman, but two wee butts. I had no brains and I had no guts. Mm. My soul is a lump of stinking shit. And I don't like it a little bit. Yeah, it really makes you think he actually hated himself, though. Right, and then you're like, well, we had something in common. <laughs> 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 um, this one I like because he wrote a lot of uh, pornography and, like, kinky, sexy poetry. And... His wife, Rose, who we've already discussed, mm -hmm. is the first of his scarlet women. These are women that are like his queen. So he is, of course, the ordained king, god, mouthpiece of whomever they have access to. Rose is, he declares, you are my scarlet woman. You are like my right hand, my, my virgin Mary to the baby Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. As almost as holy as I and as critical to my religion as I. Mm -hmm. What we will learn is that he has give or take 10 of those <laughs> throughout the course of his life. And <laughs> most of the women who love Aleister Crowley and the majority of the women who marry him end up alcoholic, homeless prostitutes who are either committed to insane asylums or imprisoned until their death. There are a number of these. And the questions that this writer asks and that a number of his biographers have asked is, did Aleister Crowley draw to him personalities already subject to trauma slash and or mental illness mm -hmm. and or uh, abuse and or whatever or was he such a bastard mm -hmm. that he broke the people who loved him and we will find yeah. out um but this ugh, it's so complicated when rose was recovering from childbirth he wrote her a series of hysterical and filthy little poems just to cheer her up and make her laugh. Oh. And this one is, There once was a young lady named Rose who filled not one palm but twelve pose with piss, sweat, and cum, thick slime from her bum, and snot from her bloody old nose. Oh, isn't that sweet? That I mean, was going to cheer her up? Can't you just picture holding <laughs> little <laughs> Alistair <laughs> Jr.? <laughs> And being like, oh, you minx. Oh. <laughs> Say it again. Everybody. <laughs> oh, um, God. I mentioned that he was a mountain climber. Mm -hmm. And the story that I'm going to tell you next is about his most significant mountain climbs. Because I think literally, spiritually, and figuratively, Aleister Crowley as a mountain climber demonstrates his highest highs and his lowest lows in terms of what he was able to do and what a shit he was. Ooh, okay. And also physically. And also physically hired a he god. He goes as high as he, yeah. When Crowley was first at Cambridge and, and he was studying kind of cool and just sort of this young kind of table flipper guy, he had started doing mountain climbing. And at the point we're going to meet him now, he does some for real serious, still is in the record books, independently of spirituality, independently of the occult. He is listed among some of the great mountain climbers of all time. And here's your question. 
Okay. Alistair Crowley was a significant mountain climber and held records for reaching heights no one could beat for decades after him. Which famous mountain did Alistair Crowley not climb? A. K2. This is on the border of Pakistan and China. It is the second tallest mountain on earth next to Everest. B. Kanchenjunga a sacred mountain in Nepal and the third tallest peak in the world after K2, or C, Annapurna, the most deadly mountain in the world, also in Nepal. Which one of those three did he not climb? Mm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess two. Kanchenjunga. Yeah, uh... Uh, it was Annapurna, the most deadly mountain in the world, also uh, in Nepal. Um, but you were two. You had two in the I bay. Had two you, out you, of three. Now you see. Now you're humanized. Now people know that you're real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the first mountain that K two he climbs with this guy Eckenstein, who he had met when he was young. Who they came together because they're both avid mountain climbers. Eckenstein was the lead on that climb. And they got, if, if the mountain is give or take 29,000 feet, they got just over 21,000 feet before they had to turn around and go back. Pretty good. Pretty fucking great, actually. And no, and this was in 1904, and no one got close to summiting that peak until the 1950s. Oh, wow. Right. So they for real, like, did it. And there were five of them. There were a lot of problems, most of them personal, because Aleister Crowley is a cunt. Such a fucking Now, dick. he yeah. is able to, for himself, singularly find that meditative focus that I assume is necessary to endure something like this. Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that gets you to control your reactions, to stay steady, to stay focused. All of these things he obviously yeah, not had panic. internally. Correct. Yeah. What he had no ability to do was to be part of a team that was around you. Uh, so it was yeah. exclusively beating the natives who were carrying his stuff, disrespecting the leader. For one thing, they had a, the limit of the weight that they could carry up the mountain. And they all agreed, yeah, we all bring this amount and we can't bring any more. And he insisted on bringing several huge books of poetry. <laughs> Girl. Plus heavy. a magic crystal collection. Yeah, <laughs> guys, I need this. <laughs> he was like, I need this. And he refused to leave it. <gasps> and it wasn't like he was carrying it all because he's also beaten the fucks who have to carry this stuff, right? Jesus. So, yeah, but they do get very high. They do very well. And nobody died. Not on that one. <laughs> hmm. Now, the next big one was that second mountain in your quiz, the one that you thought was the one, the Kenjin, Ken, Kanchenjunga, which is a sacred mountain in Nepal. Third tallest peak in the world after K2. And it's only like a few hundred feet less. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? This one, Eckenstein, who had been his his leader in the previous expedition and his closest like mountaineering friend, uh, was like, I'm not going with you again. Good. Right? Yeah. He's like, yeah. forget it. Some other guy had come and said to Alistair, we're going to climb the Kanganjunga. What do you think? And he was like, yeah, let's get Eckenstein. He was like, you pulled a gun on me. <laughs> like... <laughs> Not nah, like I might um, drink with you again. You have great LSD, but like, I'm not. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely not. So he goes, Alistair Crowley, and he's the leader oh. of the expedition this time. Yeah. Terrible. And why these idiots would follow him yeah. is their own deal. Now, this is a big, fat, scary mountain. There are tons of fights. There's tons of mutinies among the guys, but they're still just like, oh, you know, climbing. They're Gotta doing it. Yeah. it. They're going up and they're doing the thing. The government presently, as you and I said, it has banned expeditions up this mountain at this point. It is so deadly and so dangerous and also so sacred to yeah, the Nepalese yeah. people who live there that it has been closed just since 2000. No one can A bunch of it. British dudes just pissing all over it. Absolutely. As they're climbing, the way that they were climbing, the way that their pursuit was going was similar to what they had done with K2, which was essentially they would split the group in half for the most part. One group would carve a staircase, mm -hmm. get get a nice level area, and then set up camp. Yeah. And then the group would come up that fairly easy pull. And the question is, what route are we going to take? We want to go left or right? That, play, that way looks harder from here, but once mm -hmm. we get around that corner, it will be the smarter way. And they're all trying to figure this out. Yeah. At some point, the team stops following him. They're like, we disagree 
you are telling us that after this base camp, we're going to go and it's been hard and slip and whatever. And we're not, we think you're wrong and we're not going to go with you. In fact, we are done and we're going to start climbing down the mountain. Now they are at this point higher than anyone has ever been before. Should be good enough. And right. And Alistair sees the way he wants to go and thinks he can go. But he says they turn around and there's like five and they're like, we're going to start going back down to the base camp that is below us. The one that we left last night. And he says, don't do it. It's not a great time to go. And they do it anyway. And on the way down, four of them fall to their deaths. (gasps) Three porters and one of the English mountain climbers that he had been traveling with. And when he hears their screams, he stays in his tent and has tea told you so and the next day when he climbs down he essentially climbs past not just i mean i don't know if it's their bodies but the camp frozen bodies he climbs down past the camp without saying anything without stopping to the one guy who's left presumably um there were they had a bigger group on this second oh okay um and he just leaves leaves everyone else behind doesn't say Mm -hmm. goodbye and also is by himself down this yeah but he's on his way going down and he feels confident you know that he can do the thing but yeah and it's like uh again this is i tell this story not only because i want to point out like he achieved record breaking to his peers to history substantially impressive feats of both engineering yeah. and endurance. That is a like, great he height. He could have been a hero. Right. But he's but a villain. he doesn't give a fuck about anybody but himself. And to highlight how much worse it is, why you can see my face start to scowl as I'm going page by page mm-hmm. with this book, is because in addition to that, Aleister Crowley mocked the native Nepalese who were carrying his shit for being superstitious about the mountain being haunted. This guy, <laughs> his quote is the imaginations got out of hand and they began, began to talk nonsense about the demons of Kankanjunga. And I'm like, what? And it just, again, goes to prove he is essentially a racist, mm-hmm. a continentalist, an egomaniac. I mean, so many people from that era. Right. Like, that, and yeah. Even though he believes deeply, more deeply than anyone I've ever encountered of a spiritual realm of a dark and scary force. And even though he must, to some extent, have acknowledged that these mountains do have, to an extent, these are, he was like, these idiots are like, oh, it's haunted. It's like, yeah. Oh, God, you're a fucking asshole. Yeah. Um. Now, to his credit, again, the teams that do successfully summit Kankanjunga 50 years later took the route he was trying to take. Oh. And there's a lot of ways up a mountain. Mm-hmm. And they were like, and they don't like Aleister Crowley. Mountaineers have been trying to hide from him forever. He was yeah. taking off all sorts of lists. They're like, ah, oh, this fucking psycho abuser, drug addict. It's embarrassing. Thing. Yeah. But then they like him probably like, yeah, it was totally like, he was right. Like, he totally had the right idea. And if he would have kept going, who knows what would have happened. But, yeah, yeah, that was the way we went because it was the best way to go. Back. Mm. Are you ready for a really disgusting, kinky story? Yeah. God, I don't. There's a lot of them. If you'd like to digest a significant amount of torture porn mm. and bestiality and borderline cannibalism mm. and deep abuse of people. Good news. Wow. Have you come to the right place? <laughs> I don't want to go through all of that because yeah. it's so bad, but um, I can't <laughs> tell the whole story of Alex Crowley without giving you some idea of the depth of depravity Ooh. involved with these rituals. Why, you know, everything I've told you so far is kind of a cunt. He's mm-hmm. not the wickedest man in the right. world. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <sighs> mom, I'll meet you. Go, I don't know, scroll ahead like five minutes. You're probably not going <laughs> like this. It comes to sex magic. Sex magic is a significant part of Aleister Crowley's life. He, lowercase italics, sex magic. It's how he calls it in his diary. It's how he discusses it with people around him, a little sex magic. And he spells magic often with a K because it's a different magic. His magic mm, is different. Than yeah. You know, it's like when you spell Shelly with an I, you're not just Shelly. Yeah. Shelly. So magic. <laughs> Blood sugar sex. Yes. Is it? Mm, okay. We don't know if it's related to the Red Hot Chili Peppers or not, but anyway. Hard to say. Probably. Yeah. Rock and roll. Um, but yeah, when he talks about sex magic, he is, of course, talking about intercourse sex, but he's also talking about the the function and use of semen and menstrual blood, 
These are all pivotal acetamine. Oh, here we yeah. go. Buckle I mean, up. We're getting okay. in there. It's getting gross. gross. It gets more violent and it gets more intense and it gets more uh, shocking the older he gets. But it's always pretty much present in the magic. I that mean, he that's was doing. like all evil people, right? They get like Seems it's like the they need to get higher and higher, yeah. and yeah, yeah. I don't think they're chill out unless they're medicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Alistair Crowley has hundreds of lovers, thousands, arguably. They are across the gender spectrum. Um, he has scores of sex, prostitutes. And most of the people are married, men, women, old, young, um, and. At times, um, he has these scarlet women, as I've discussed. And mm -hmm. as I also discussed, they, to a person, end up broken and institutionalized. This, what I'm about to tell you, might be why. Mm -hmm. In one documented act of sex magic, in which Aleister Crowley was hoping to unlock a very significant power source for himself, as well as witnessing the great sort of uh, summation of various powerful entities. He gathers the necessary, and this would be the kind of stuff that would have been in those sacred scrolls. Why you got to break into the vault and get the good stuff? Because mm -hmm. you get the recipe for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need a goat to have sex with his wife. The with goat the scarlet fucks woman. the wife. Sure, correct. Okay. So we need the goat to fuck his wife, lots of people watching, because it's going to be a very special room. Mm -hmm. And when the goat climaxes, you slit its throat, and the blood that mixes with its semen and her vaginal secretions and all of this is this very, very potent, powerful thing Potion. that mm -hmm. you can use in various ways. Well, I know this isn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> However, and I know people fuck goats. I like you fuck the goat. I feel like it's a lot to ask a goat to fuck you. I think yeah. it's a lot to ask. And this didn't work it out. It seems tricky. And the first thing was, yeah, like, A, I'm not saying the goat wasn't into his wife, but there's a lot of pressure, a lot of people watching. What's with the knife? The idea that any <laughs> the idea that any creature is like, I'm in, let's fuck yeah. and then is gonna come. Like, yeah. I'm not again, disparage your wife, but who knows what goats are into? Yeah. The I don't think it's humans. Kind but... of fucks her, but doesn't come. Anyway, it's not working out. Mm -hmm. The goat ain't doing the thing. So Alistair just slits its throat anyway. Yeah. And everybody plays in the blood and then Has an orgy? wraps it up. Ta da! No, where's not, there's a goat I blood mean, orgy? I, I mean, know. we can assume. Somebody's got it. Yeah. But the bottom line is this I'm is sure what I all... mean. This is what I mean. Yeah taken perfectly if you could just take the ancient stroll and get the goat and the goat comes and you do the blood and the steam that's the best case <laughs> scenario <laughs> and what i'm saying is is that it didn't even do that and this is again indicative of alistair crowley even if you want to like oh a goat blood yes if a goat comes in your wife yes i agree that is very very serious he didn't even do it no he couldn't do it he you didn't see, do it do you think he just wanted to see that yeah i do why I hate Aleister Crowley isn't just because he's a bad guy. It's because even by his own standards, he was a failure and a half-assed fucking liar about it. Mm -hmm. Here are some more examples I put under the category of not quite God, a.k.a. never meet your heroes. <laughs> 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 and it is one. There's this poor bastard named Victor Newberg. Very rich guy okay. who is devoted to Aleister Crowley, believes deeply in his divinity, d d believes deeply in his access to the divine and the paranormal, who gives him all of his money, which is great. Because Aleister, for all the money he had, and he inherited like three fortunes, he squanders it, girl. He don't work. Yeah. All they ever made money on was publishing, occasionally selling artwork. But mostly he's realized at this point in his life now, it's about getting money from people who believe in him. Uh -huh. And he can, and he's a con, and it's give me your devotion. Again, if you're yeah. got a toe over Scientology, this all makes sense. You prove your devotion by just giving me all of your earthly belongings. And Victor Newberg is like, done, girl, take it, can't wait. Also, would you be so kind as to walk me on a leash through India? Oh, that was his thing. Correct. Okay. And Aleister Crowley said, I'd be glad to. <laughs> Sounds fun as fuck. Right. And he does. So Victor Newberg, abused, sodomized, beaten, starved, loves it. Oh, wow. His greatest disciple has walked, please, yes, sir, may I have another um, stuff. So, and ultimately, this guy, this devotee, leaves Aleister Crowley because he finds out that Aleister has simultaneously been sending ransom notes to his mother asking for more money. Oh. <gasps> 
Wow, he, I, I'm just kind of surprised someone like that would actually be like, wait a minute, you can't do that to my mom. Well, I think it was something like what I'm talking about, which is that crack of daylight between what God, mm-hmm. what person with a divine link to the Almighty is lying and extorting money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's that, it's the shred of doubt. Mm-hmm. Okay. He establishes this religion Thelema, which we've talked about. And this is in the early 1920s. And, and in it, he, he's built this abbey of Thelema, which is in Sicily. And this place resembles the most what will come later in the century of like the Manson commune, the uh, Scientology abusive areas, which is uh, we everything goes here. So we're isolated. Mm-hmm. The kids live with us. Everyone can have sex with whoever they want. Including the kids. Including the I kids. Guess. Yeah. Kids see all of this stuff. Tons of drugs. Tons of psychedelic drugs. Nothing's clean. There's not like a cleaning service coming through here because he's his money. And he's also developed a taste for heroin. He was for a while just doing sort of mind expanding laudanum, opium, drugs that were a part of his rituals. And now we're just into straight cocaine, heroin. Still doing all of his sex magic. A lot of like, oh, yes, I hang upside down from my ankles in the closet while you hit her. It's the nasty ass stuff is happening in this Abbey of Sicily. And at one point, a married couple comes to the Abbey of Thelema in Sicily because, again, word is spreading. We've heard. We've heard. We're in. It's fun. We love it. Mm. You're God. Can't wait. And the husband's super into it. And the wife is like, less into it. Of course. But participating. And after a while, her husband gets very, very sick and dies. She thinks it's because he drank the blood of a cat. Could have been. Could be. (laughs) Could be because he was starved and beaten, or he had to drink from this ugly, uh, this like poisonous stream that ran outside. Terrible STD. Who knows? Who knows? But she goes back to London and dishes. Oh. They are doing some creepy shit nasty out there in illegal Sicily. shit i wonder why he let her leave that seems almost like well mm-hmm. this is why in the future they don't right don't let's look at our modern day cults it is one of the reasons why y'all don't leave yeah right because in addition unless to, you're going to heaven right oh you can do that anytime you like. <laughs> um and but there's but there's a hidden benefit to alistair because yeah he gets kicked off <laughs> He gets kicked out of Sicily. The Italians are like, yuck, yeah, perverts. <laughs> so he has to leave, but also this wonderfully modern thing. Again, I told you, you know, if you can understand Aleister Crowley, you will understand the 20th and the 21st century a lot better. Mm. Because this a girl comes in, she's like, my husband's dead, the blood of cats, kids are watching us, fuck, goats. It's crazy. Sewage and the water. media was like, wait, hold on, we have to get a pen. Hang on, you don't move a muscle. <laughs> I, we are, this is great. And so the media starts to have competing stories about who can you know sex at drug fiends oh like the national inquirer mm. yeah only yeah but this it's, is the only yeah. we don't have tablet this is this all just is regular. real yeah. but they're in their competition to expose and publish stories that are selling like hotcakes of this crazy sexy druggy awesome thing that's going out there in the middle of the woods is they are of course simultaneously lifting Alistair Crowley up. Mm -hmm. They are helping to build his myth. They are helping to draw people in. He starts selling more books because he's been publishing books of poetry for the last 20 years. People are like, fuck this guy. Now they're going out to get his book and it, and it ends up being ultimately great. Even if he loses place, this Abbey of Thelema is still out there, girl. Mm -hmm. And it is this crazy dilapidated, like, rotten walls and plants you can see the paint oh. on the walls the the den of nightmares is in there and hikers and people who care will go out there every now and again and take pictures or fuck so each other give each other hand or whatever they're into kill a goat but you can go on youtube you can see it. it's gross it's weird there's a little um division people may at me about his work during the two world wars um he took credit for world war <laughs> He was thought he was so powerful. He was the most powerful magician. He can summon demons. He can pull in monsters of the new age. He could affect the magnetic power of the entire globe. And so when World War I started, he literally wrote a letter to the British Navy and was like, sorry about that. And they were like, what's that? And he's like, I started World War I. My bad. (laughs) I'm like, oh, my God. And then during World War, and he was a spy. He was always for the bad guys. And he took credit, tried to take credit for Hitler 
basically saying, and it and there are some connections that are valid, like th- because we live in I the mean, Hitler era, was into the occult and totally, shit, right? Totally, totally, totally. And this is where I, we start to bring into why Aleister Crowley's disgustingly long fingernails are still clinging on to our modern age because we live, of course, the internet did nothing but good things for Aleister Crowley. We also love conspiracy theories. Woo! Mm, yeah. love, you know, Satanism, always very attractive. And the reasons and ways he creeps in are often through these stories, which are sort of have like one part fact mm-hmm. and 10 part myth. A little thread of truth, but yeah. So what I want to try to do now is kind of walk through the things that bring it into our modern times. Um, so people say Aleister Crowley, is why we had Hitler in World War II. The truth of that is Thelema existed, his the book of the law, which seems very much yeah. like the Superman, do what thou wilt, the, the meek are useless to us, cut them out, weed them out, mm-hmm. eugenics, all this kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And he knew a gal who knew Hitler, who loved Thelema, and he said, don't you think you should go ahead and give the Fuhrer some of my pages we're looking for a new religion we're looking for a new uh, eon i'm your guy how about me and he claims and people who say yep and then she did and then hitler basically did what he did because he was inspired by the writings of aleister crowley in reality yes those things all existed at the same time the gal that he gave the thing to was like no 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 i never actually gave that to hitler and hitler wrote mein kampf in jail mein kampf includes the vast majority of his psychological layout that produced, and that was written long before he would have had any access to Aleister Crowley. Mm-hmm. But there's just enough truth for anyone, including the internet, who wants to believe it to... Like, we know who this lady was. And, and she is... knew both of these men. Correct. Now, yeah. I mean, I think it's just more of a great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> deal than, than like who, like I was the only one who ever thought. What if I just killed everybody I didn't like? Ooh, I'm so original. <laughs> Good for you. Um, he, uh, but basically he was trying to sell it. He was basically like it would do great things for my book sales, and Thelema would really mm-hmm. thrive mm-hmm. if the Third Reich would just adopt it. Would take my branding. Yeah, yeah exactly. There are many conspiracy theories that Aleister Crowley has a link to the American presidency. Buckle up. I told you about these weird-ass sexy orgy things. Mm-hmm. In one of Aleister Crowley's very powerful sex magic events, it was vital that all of the people gathered at his salon get him to the point of complete sexual exhaustion. Okay. Which I think sounds great. I, I can't disagree with Aleister Crowley. Everybody come over and just fuck me until I can't stand it anymore. Isn't the worst party I've ever heard of. But the idea is that everybody fucks, everybody fucks me until I am practically unconscious because I couldn't get fucked in any more holes, no more holes, no more cum, no more everything is completely Drained. exhausted. Right. The theory is that at this sexual exhaustion sex magic moment, one of the attendees was a young, fun American socialite named Pauline Pierce. That she was there. The theory then goes on that she got pregnant. Sure. Could it have been Alistair Crowley's baby? Because she does have a baby about 10 months later. And that baby is Barbara Pierce, who marries George H.W. Bush, mm. becoming Barbara Bush. Meaning the line is that Alistair Crowley is the father of Barbara Bush. Therefore, <gasps> Aleister Crowley's genetic line was the what? wife of one American president and the mother of another American president. And that it was Aleister Crowley's dark magic and that this ritual worked because his semen was actually able to infest the genetic line of an American president. Oh, and by the way, guys, that was my goal. Like, I mean, that seems like something you would say later, right? Exactly. Like, now, I meant the to people who are like, that's a fascinating story. Ooh, whoa. Mm-hmm. Bullshit. First of all, we don't even know if Pauline Pierce was there. That can't be confirmed. Then that she fucked him. Then he got her pregnant. Maybe. And then in like the early aughts, some guy was like, oh my God, I totally made that up as an April Fool's joke in the early days of the internet. <laughs> and I did it to see, just to see... Can you spread a rumor on the internet? On the internet? I wonder if you just said something completely batshit fucking nuts. If anyone might believe it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, buddy. <laughs> oh, everybody does. <laughs> oh, good news. <laughs> Aleister Crowley finally fucking dies. And let me tell you what. I <laughs> Look how thick this fuck 
fucking book is, Hyla? It's big. And I have, honestly, I didn't cover this weird guy, Alan Bennett, who he, like, follows to... Uh, Tibet and becomes briefly a Buddhist monk. He's like super into yoga and he gets a bunch of people to do his yoga shit. I haven't, I mean, there he goes from, and every time I turn the page, I was like, if this fucking guy isn't dead in two years, when does he fucking die? I go on Wikipedia and be like, all right, he doesn't have a lot of years left and he'd do five more things and, and just do eight more terrible lives. And I'd be like, God damn, when are we going to kill this fucking guy? Well, he finally, oh, he finally dies in 1947. He is broke. He's been broke for decades. He has been trying like hell to sell his books, to sell his poetry, to sell his paintings, to get more devotees, to give him more money, or maybe just let him live at their house for a little yeah. while. Put a tent in your yard. He's um, he's joined up with some other cults. It started. <laughs> there was this cult called the OTO short for Latin phrase and they are still very active and they were generally born hmm. in Britain. And there was like this little fissure between them at first that was like, you stole our documents and no you stole." And they both kind of have this loose claim to the golden dawn. But then right before it like came to blows, they were like, I think that we're both hearing from the same God brother, join with me brother. <laughs> and so they became kind of one and Alistair Crowley sort of became a member of the OTOs. They, they jerked each other off in the sense that it was like, I'll give you the high order of magus promotus in my, and then you will give me the order of mega promotus of your, and then we together will form the chamber that now dictates what happens in both, you know. They make and it, we'll rule the it world. Yeah, and, we'll yeah. make it up. But this will sell things. We'll, my books will become part of your assets. And all of this is also just like the lawsuits when he was outside yeah. the Golden Dawn, there's this, boy, the material world is never that far away in the sense that he signs over ownership of some of his properties to the OTO so that they're technically liable. I mean, there's lots of... Yeah, wheeling and dealing. And, yeah. yeah. He gets sued all the time because somebody died at his thing. Part of his commands, you got to cut yourself every time you say the word I. Every time you speak as if you are an individual, you have to cut yourself to stop. I mean, it's Whoa, fucking that's nuts. that's so major are... culty. Very. Wow. Sister, it doesn't come out of nowhere, right? So he loses some serious lawsuit, but he's already bankrupt. Nobody can take any more money from him because he's just this old heroin addict with bumbling, whatever. And this woman named Deidre McClellan who has a couple of illegitimate kids, walks up to him after his court appearance and says, God, Alistair Crowley, I love you, and they did you wrong, and I'd like to have your baby. And he says, okie doke. And she gets pregnant with his baby, and then guess what? Hmm. She's a really good woman who takes care of him until he dies. Oh, Isn't that the what? worst? She's like really, she like helps him clean up. He kind of cleans up. It's almost like the end of Walk the Line. <laughs> it's, like, it's like she helps him kind of kick heroin ish. You know, he doesn't get totally clean, but like he cleans up. <clears throat> he has kind of this nice, peaceful life. She has his kid and she just treats him well until he dies in his bed at 72. 72? And his last words are. <laughs> his last words were. I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to do, I'll leave you with a story. Oh, God, this story. I thought I would be done there. I kind of, oh, that'd be great. And then I'll tell her about the rock and roll legacy of Aleister Crowley. Boom. And then I stumbled upon the story of Jack Parsons. Oh. We're near the end of Aleister Crowley's life, World War II, and the OTO combined with Aleister Crowley's Thelema, has a lodge, a branch in Pasadena, California. Oh, right outside. Right down the street. And other things that are big, of course, in that part of Pasadena are the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a lot of important experimentation on nuclear weapons and jet propulsion. Um, and Aleister Crowley's getting wind that there's this problem within this new lodge because the, the founder... Wilfred Talbot Smith is being accused of, wait for it, sexual abuse. No. Yes. Of his members in the lodge. Women who were new to the lodge, he'd say, now you got it. You're my sex slave. Can you believe yep. it? Yeah. And what's wilder is that Aleister Crowley was like, how dare you? He came down there to crack skulls. Very weird. Lodge. Some people tell you there's pages on the internet that will describe Aleister Crowley as a feminist. 
Mm-hmm. Their only argument is that everybody he fucked would seem to be into it. Mm. Um, which is not the most unfair thing I've ever heard. I still wouldn't call him a feminist, no. but he did tend to be like, you're taking advantage of these people. <laughs> I don't know. Pa, I mean, you're it, looking awfully black today. Very, <laughs> very <laughs> arbitrary. Yeah. Um, but there's this problem. So Alistair Crowley comes down there and he's like, oh, you're fucking wives and you're making mem-. And the big problem actually isn't just that it's sex abuse. It's that this guy is having sex with the wife of a guy who is works at this jet propulsion laboratory, i.e. a good mm. get for your cult. Like, don't piss this guy off, mm-hmm. right? We Our cult gets, you got your Tom Cruise. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? If we lose Tom Cruise, <laughs> everyone's just going to think we're a bunch of weirdos, you know? And this guy's great, and he's kind of an un, a crazy genius, this Jack Parsons. He has no degree. He's never went to engineering school, and he is working deeply in the jet propulsion laboratory and all these rocket research firms secretly, because he's just like a fucking genius. He's just got it, right? And all of the like mega engineers are like coming to him for answers. And he's into this cult and he believes in the Lehman. Yes, 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 yes. How old is he at this? Um, mid 20s. Okay. Alistair or Jack Parsons? Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is in his like mid 20s, early 30s. And he's also. Dangerous term to be a man. Deep, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so he then. Alistair Crowley comes in, kicks out the bad leader and doesn't just like clear the decks, but it's like you, Jack Parsons, you should be the leader of this lodge. Smart. And he's like, okay, great. And one of the things that Jack Parsons believes in is actually this old school shit that Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and a lot of like weird figures that these Thel- Thelema cultists love believe in, which is strict non-monogamy. Mm. Like it is really important actually that you fuck as many people as possible because that's what keeps us both going. And Jack Parsons is like, I want you wife to have sex with L. Ron Hubbard, who is a member of the same lodge here in Pasadena and also in the Navy, a military guy at the time. Mm. So L. Ron Hubbard starts having sex with Jack Parsons wife as instructed. And then Jack Parsons wife, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, in addition to being spiritual and fucking and all in the same lodge, also come up with some weird business thing where they're making money on yachts. What? (laughs) They're like buying yachts and selling yachts for a profit. Huh. Okay. This is all under this, (laughs) right? Weird umbrella. And then all of a sudden, Aleister Crowley starts getting messages that here's what they're going to do. Um... (laughs) Through these texts and ancient scrolls, Jack Parsons is trying to make a moon child. And a moon child has to do with coming onto a disc and then and then communicating with an elemental and trying to bring into physical manifestation a creature that can hold the sperm that you've put on the disc i don't ex- i don't understand it <laughs> i mean he was a genius though so he was a genius we're so obviously not that thing. smart and alistair's like they're trying to make a moon child not on my watch <laughs> <laughs> And so while he's coming down to crack skulls on that, L. Ron Hubbard runs off with Jack Parsons' wife and all of his life savings. <gasps> it is a financial theft. They just take off. Mm-hmm. And Jack Parsons leaves the OTO, leaves the cult, stops pursuing L. Ron and his wife. And one day, while well, he's working in his laboratory... So he stays working for... Yeah, he okay. kind of... I mean, it was all secret. So it's not like, you know, you, the idea is that you always... These cult leaders, they always lead a double life. A normal, often mm-hmm. professional life. And then this kooky harness mask stuff <laughs> that they're doing at home. And on June 20th, 1952, Jack Parsons is working in his garage, as he does. And he drops a vial of fulminite mercury. And he blows his ass up. Oh! <gasps> himself and his whole lab and when his mom hears about it she commits suicide oh my god Mm -hmm. which begs the question is the universe actually so tightly knit that if you fuck with this magic you are cursed i mean i do kind of think that certain people Maybe Aleister Crowley is one of them. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. My thing, as I said at the beginning, my issue is Aleister Crowley is undoubtedly great. Smart, strong, rich, influential. Brave. Brave. Sure. And these are words that taken in a vacuum are kind. Um, Compliments. Compliments. Yeah, yeah. But he is not good. And I know that that's a really interpretable word, 
But greatness without goodness to me as a historian is so useless and so unimpressive. There are more great people in human existence than I think that we sometimes recognize. Greatness actually isn't that hard, especially if you are very, very rich Mm -hmm. and a white male in a place and time of privilege. To be great is actually no big deal. To be powerful, to run a company, to have the ability to to change the lives of hundreds of people based on a choice you make, that actually is super pedestrian, man. Mm -hmm. It's an aspiration for a lot of us as individuals, but in the course of human history, there's lots of greats. Greats don't make the pages of history. It's the good or the bad of your greatness Mm -hmm. that gets your name written down, you know? And when I look at figures like Oscar Wilde, who, when he was arrested for being gay, said consciously and wrote consciously, this is an unjust law of which I am guilty. And by serving my time, I will show you how unjust in part this law is. I will experience what this is. I will write poetry. It's about truth. It's about service. It's about honesty. It's about handling a situation in a way that demonstrates the fullness of your trust and the rightness of the universe, right? When you encounter a character like Aleister Crowley, who wants to take your money and take your body, give me power, give me fame, I've read this 500 fucking pages. He gives nothing to anyone ever. Yeah. He shares nothing with anyone ever. And maybe that's what people mean when they say, like, you're fucking with the magic. But no, you just, it's that person is so bad. Mm -hmm. They're going to infect and ruin everyone around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, L. Ron Hubbard, of course, writes Dianetics in the 1950s. My grandma had a copy of that book when I was a kid in yeah. the 80s. Oh, I remember seeing him on a lot of bookshelves mm-hmm. in my life. Um, one set of hands that Dianetics landed in was a young Charles Manson. Oh. Yeah. While he was, um, while he was in jail on McNeil Island, he got real into sci-fi. And he read Dianetics. Now, he didn't seem to be into it. <laughs> Bad um, review. Yeah, right. Two stars. But, but he does emerge from that jail in 1967, no longer just a thief but a charismatic street preacher. Mm -hmm. Um, My dear friend, Hyla, goddamn. Wow. I can now put this book (gasps) a fucking way. I don't have to watch any more gross documentaries about this (laughs) creepy loser. Every murder, murder documentary and every culty, culty documentary that I watch from here on out, I'll be able to be like, took that for the book of the law plagiarized, plagiarized, Mm -hmm. secondhand occultist over here. So at least knowing, you know, the origin of the great granddaddy gives you some ammunition. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so grateful that you came. I'm so grateful that you assigned me this guy. Um, Now let's go get them nipple clamps, huh? (laughs) Oh, she's so wonderful, and you can find her, her cookbooks, her cooking shows, including the one that I was featured in from a few years back, uh, in our show notes. We make beer cheese soup, guys. Right? It's so good. Like, what whiskey can't fix for you, that one probably can. Now, we'll see you here for our next new episode, the thrilling, gasp-inducing adventure tale of The Mutiny on the Bounty. I'm so excited. I'm joined by author and historian Scott Edwin Williams as we follow the notorious Captain Bly and mutineer Christian Fletcher on the high seas and beyond. (laughs) Until then, our theme song was composed and performed by Kat Perkins. A reminder that you can find my sources, links to the books, documentaries, and articles I reference in the summary of this episode or by emailing us hilfpodcast at gmail.com or messaging us on social media at hilfpodcast. This has been Hilf, history I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody, reminding you that history is a party and everybody's coming. (laughs) 